Um, next slide, please, Sam. So this early years send partnership and many of you will be very familiar with this will be accessing support in some way whether that's the strategic support we offer to local authorities or whether that's the training that we do um, we are the lead partner the council for disabled children within this partnership and we're a coalition of six different organizations of which you can see on the screen um, in the interest of time i'm not going to go through all of them but each of us have a specialism um, that we bring to the table in terms of special educational needs and disabilities. For us at the Council for Disabled Children, we focus on statutory rights for disabled children and also um, ordinarily available provision as part of the local offer. Um, just a couple more housekeeping bits. Um, if you can keep yourselves on mute whilst we are speaking or the speakers are, that would be great. Um, there is a Q&A function um, if you see in your kind of top bar. So if you have a burning question, it'd be great if you could type it into there. Um, and do feel free to use the chat um, for comments um, throughout the presentations as well. Fantastic. And Sam's already said that she'll be there to support with any tech issues. Um, next slide, please, Sam. So just to go through the agenda quickly, um, we've done the welcome introductions and housekeeping. Um, Daniel is going to set the scene, what the expansion is and what does it mean for children with SEN disabilities, a very quick overview. Um, we're then going to have um, entitlements expansion from a policy lens from Louise. That's meant to start at 10, apologies. Um, and we'll have a little discussion after that about what does the entitlements mean for you in your area. Um, at 11 o'clock, we plan to have a break, um, 10 minute break, so we can make a cup of tea and get away from your screen for a little bit. Um, and then we'll have our second speaker of the day, Ivana from UCL, talking about some of the research around variations and take up of early years education. Then we'll have another opportunity for a discussion in breakout rooms just to reflect on that data and whether that's something you're finding in your own local areas and areas of work. Um, and then Daniel will do some closing statements. We hope to be finished up by 12 o'clock. So that is the layout of the day and I will pass over to Daniel for that setting the scene part. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Christina. And I'd uh, just like to welcome everybody again uh, to the session today. Uh, welcome from a very uh, gloomy and uh, rainy London. Um, we are really excited about this uh, session today because it is so timely, as I'm sure that most of you will know, if not all, um, that the first phase of this uh, expansion in um, entitlement is literally around the corner, beginning in April. Um, and Sam, if you don't mind, maybe popping on the next uh, slide just to kind of keep in the background. Um, I'm I'm working on the assumption that the vast majority of you will be familiar with the detail of this expansion, but it might be worth uh, just going over and kind of um, make sure we all have a baseline of shared understanding. So this first phase, which, as I say, is really just a couple of weeks away, um, uh, is in increasing the uh, entitlement for two-year-olds to 15 hours of childcare support um, at the opening of next academic year, so in September 24. Um, that will um, rise from nine months to three old. And then the last phase um, in the opening of the academic year, uh, September 25, and that would be expansion uh, to 30 hours uh, of all of those under the age of five. Um, one of the things that is probably worth setting out now, although I know it's probably obvious to everybody here, is that somewhat counterintuitively, if you're uninitiated or you're not familiar with the uh, earlier sector or indeed the SEND sector, you might think that this is in a very straightforward uh, way uh, a win and a good news uh, story. Um, however, I'm pretty certain that the, the talks we're going to have today and the input from, you, from most of you uh, will expose a slightly more complex uh, reality. Certainly for the Council for Disabled Children, as we are going around the country, either in person or virtually, and speaking to practitioners, um, this is causing a great deal of concern, and the same is actually true uh, for parent carers. And what I, I think I'm going to try and do in the next few minutes, and certainly throughout the remainder of today's uh, session, um, is to try and drill into the detail of why this is actually causing concern, um, and what are possible mitigations we can carry out. And there's going to be another conversation I think Louise is going to touch upon on some other um, ideas, how this can be bypassed on a policy level. 
it's important for me to say that the work of the Council for Disabled Children at the moment, we are also interested to see what mitigations can be put in place within the parameters of what's going on at the moment, namely uh, resigning ourselves to the fact that we can't really change uh, the level of inaccuracy of need coming through earlier settings. We can't really change in, a, in any short term way the challenges around, uh, around the workforce or funding. So I, I think we need to work on two avenues in parallel. One is kind of generate uh, creative ideas for the, the larger big policy piece. On, on the other hand, of course, also looking to practice on what we can do to try and uh, dent make a dent in the in these huge challenges facing us uh, for the moment. But like I say, the starting point for me is that somewhat counterintuitively, this, this expansion is actually causing a concern and it's causing a particular concern uh, around those children who have additional needs. Uh, and I'll try and um, elaborate on this a bit more. Um, Sam, if you can put the next slide on, please. Uh, there's one more comment I want to make for, just really for my own um, uh, peace of mind. I had a quick look through these uh, slides earlier, and I know that much of what I'm going to say now is going to be echoed and, and elaborated upon, so I, I'm not going to um, spend too long on this. So the first thing to look at is really what what is the extent of take up of the current uh, uh, provision uh, amongst those children with additional needs? Um, and the the actual data comparing those with additional needs to the wider population is very difficult to come by, and it's not in any straightforward way um, obvious. But I think there's two pieces of data I can bring to the table, maybe speaking to the um, uh, the size of the challenge. One is if you look at the difference between the take up uh, between 15 and 38 hours entitlement, you can see it's basically half um, uh, the 30 hour entitlement. We we are pretty convinced that this is at least in part, uh, a manifestation of the fact that there is concern around uh, the, the quality and suitability of provision for those with additional needs. And to put it in, in layman's terms, I think parents might be might feel easier to send a child for 15 hours a week, um, taking into account, of course, the pressures in households, for instance, around employment, etc. And it's it really is a need. Um, but the full time entitlement does still create uh, some concern uh, amongst families of those who have additional and sometimes complex needs. The other piece of data, which is not on this slide, um, is that the overall take up of formal childcare, and that is really from zero to five, um, co as compared between those with SEND and those without, is lower uh, amongst those with SEND. I think the figure I've seen was 37% uh, compared to 45%. Of course, that needs a lot of unpicking because we will not talk about the entitlements and we're talking about the whole age range and also the whole uh, spectrum of uh, special needs. So those on support as opposed to ECPs, et cetera. But it's just another um, uh, really demonstration of the fact that we do have a problem and there isn't equity in access to that uh, support. Um, and again, it could be that in the, the, the talks we have today, some more straightforward data is coming through, but that's certainly the data I have, and I, I think it's telling the same story in any event. Uh, next slide, please, Sam. Thank you. So some of the um, challenges, and again, I, I, uh, I apologize because I know for many of you, this will be part and parcel of your daily life, but I think it's important to make sure we're all uh, aware of the, the kind of hard data. Um, so one of the most um, significant challenges we have is that um, side by side with this really ambitious expansion, which is supposed to be rolled out over the next couple of years, we have a, a reduction in settings and childcare places available. Um, so we know uh, from from Coram childcare survey, there's been a significant increase in nursery closures at 50% in the last year measured. Um, we also know that only 80% 18% of uh, local authorities have said about themselves that there are enough childcare places for disabled children. This is again uh, um, uh, a figure that we, we watch closely as it comes out every year. And I believe there's a new set of data coming out uh, imminently as well, if I'm not mistaken. Um, one other uh, piece of data, which again is not on the slide, but probably worth mentioning it. In 2023, Ofsted again uh, made a comment that there are less uh, childcare places available universally. And this is really it was an important comment because there was some pushback on this data. Uh, some people suggesting that might that while there might be less nurseries, there's been expansion in places. But that also seems to be uh, rebuked and rebuffed 
quite solidly by Ofsted. So this picture is very clear. We have on the one hand an expansion, and on the other hand, a reduction in, in um, the, the absolute number of both uh, settings and places. Some of the reasons for these closures, again, would be well familiar to you. Um, insufficient income to meet rise, rising costs. There's been a relatively recent um, uh, study by IFS showing that actually earlier settings suffer more severely than households, for instance, um, with the cost of living crisis. And that's, I, I think, a, a useful measure for us to see how, how dire the situation is financially um, and workforce related issues. We talk about it a lot day in, day out, both in uh, recruitment and retention. Um, and of course, the, the other underlying causes like uh, uh, pay structures, um, the status of the profession, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Sam. And just a, a few thoughts on the policy approach. Uh, for me, uh, I, I'm not taking a position per se. I'm rather, um, I suppose, probing with some questions which I think are worthwhile um, uh, putting to you, who, who many of you work on the front line, and I think it would be interesting to hear uh, your thoughts. Um, the first point is that many people in the sector and around are uh, increasingly getting the impression that early years education is being seen as approached on, at a policy level as a tool or leverage to encourage parents back into the workforce. And when I say parents, and by and large, I'm talking about mothers because that seems to be um, kind of the immediate impact. Um, again, that's an open question. I, I, I cannot say that I've heard this uh, declared openly anywhere, but I think certainly be, between the lines and, and in some of the discourse around the policy that appears to be um, a suspicion worth interrogating further. Um, if that is the case, or even if it's partly the case, that raises significant questions about how the sector and the professionals who work within it are being understood and supported. Um, we, of course, and I, I don't make uh, uh, any attempt to hide this, in the Council for Disabled Children, we believe that the work, early years workforce, like the wider education workforce, needs to be treated with utmost respect, needs to be trained adequately, paid adequately, um, and they need to have a strong enough status to ensure that we do have um, a reasonably solid uh, grounding in recruitment and retention. Um, and clearly, if the approach to early years um, uh, is really a secondary to the, the wider utilitarian approach to um, beefing up uh, the workforce, that suggests we might have a problem over there. And very importantly, what does this mean for our constituency, namely those with additional needs and send? Uh, we know that oftentimes, um, uh, and, and we would like to think that usually most children should be able to be supported in the mainstream settings, but that does require the right level of staffing, certainly the right, the right level of training and support for those staff, enough uh, resources like time, uh, to take to consider seriously reasonable adjustments um, in advance of children coming to the settings, having enough time and resource and capacity to have meaningful liaisons with both the families and carers, but also with other professionals, expert uh, uh, professionals, allied health, etc. Um, so again, questions worth asking. And lastly, and specifically around the expansion of the entitlement, are those who are most in need actually receiving the most help? Um, I, I mean, again, I'm asking the question. The fact that I'm asking the question probably suggests that we, we do have some concerns around that as well. And I, I think that at least one of our speakers today will be touching upon that point exactly and certainly worth uh, considering it. The bottom line is that the fact that we know that in previous expansions, those who probably needed the expansion the most, and within them, I would put also those in, in financial and social economic um, uh, challenges, but also those with send tend to come out worse off from, from this uh, policy move. And that's something we're very concerned about and, and a key driver uh, for today's uh, session. Uh, next uh, slide, please, Sam. Um, so I've set out, I think, and forgive me, I know I was speaking at pace. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very eager to make sure that our speakers can come in and have uh, um, enough time to do the bit. So I made an effort to set out uh, the scene um, to say clearly that while expansion of entitlement is a positive, there are some um, possibly unintended uh, consequences which we would like to drill into and uh, interrogate a bit more today. Um, before I hand over to Liz uh, in, in a second, just to say, 
A very important part of the day for us is always the conversations that come after the uh, the talks. Uh, we would encourage you uh, to speak up freely. We actually take these conversations very seriously. We make notes of them and we feed into uh, future seminars and events, which Christina will speak about later. And we also feed this back to policymakers. Uh, so this is not only of course, it is important that we have a chance to hear each other and, and kind of gain some strength from coming together as a sector. But but it also has an, another um, very important point, which is we do actually feed these conversations through, of course, anonymously, etc. But we do give intelligence both to DFE and to other policymakers um, to make sure that we use our ear uh, on the ground, as it were. So. Um, that's probably enough for me at this point. Uh, I'm delighted uh, to welcome Louise Woodward from the Joseph Rantley Foundation. I, I know you've been working for a good while now uh, on this piece of um, early years education and specifically with the lens of uh, policy and also how into how the we, we have an interest in SEND, but how that intersects with other vulnerabilities and then particularly the financial bit, um, which is of course so important because uh, childcare and, and early years education uh, does not live in isolation. Um, households have other factors going on, inc including employment, including financial hardship, etc. So really good of you to join us uh, today, Louise, and I will now hand over to you. Hi and hi everybody. First of all, can, I, can you hear me? Just brilliant. And then secondly, I'll share my screen and then I'll... I'll introduce myself um so if i can do this if not i'll have to ask Louise, we can't hear you too well now for speaking. Can you not hear me? Oh, we can hear you now. Yeah, that's OK, great. fine. Let me just just forward. Um, Teams is a bit slow this morning. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to get that on the full screen for you. Um, you see that as a full screen or just as slides? Yeah, we can see it as slides. Um, there's a little toolbar at the bottom saying you know to go through the slides but it's on the full screen is that great okay brilliant thank you so sorry do you want to get the tech first ready first before uh, starting my talk so um really great to be here my name is Louise Woodruff um I'm uh work at the Joseph Rowntree Foundation we are a charitable foundation with our headquarters in York so I'm in a, a very cloudy York today um, we work on lots of different um, policy issues, um, uh, really with a focus on tackling poverty and hardship uh, across the UK. And today um, I'm going to talk about our childcare work, but there's plenty of information on our website, which is newly brand new website. With lots of the uh, different reports and um, cover, uh, things I'm going to talk about today are on there, and we'll we'll make sure we share that as well as the the slides. So, my job I think today is to try to give a, a policy perspective, and um, I'm actually going to zoom out to zoom in again, and I hope that's going to be really helpful to think about like the new if we um, have these expansions in entitlements that are uh, being rolled out, some of the issues that we've already heard from Daniel on childcare, like how does it all sit and why do we really, why do we care about it? Not just from the, just thinking about the child's perspective, family's perspective and settings, but also just thinking of it from a, a national policy perspective as well. And so I'm going to do that. Um, I'm then going to um, think about our own childcare work, what we what we've been saying um, to policymakers, sort of putting out there as our messages on thinking about childcare and disadvantage in particular, to think about the expansion, what that means, um, to, but also to suggest some alternatives, like how if we were going to start again or start from scratch, how would how could we do things differently, and particularly what would that mean, and what would we need to ensure for uh, children with SEND? So. I'm actually going to start off by talking about um, poverty. And every year, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation produces a really brilliant resource 
Um, great if you're you're doing research or or really want to drill down to into these issues. It's, this year it's obviously called UK Poverty and UK Poverty 2024. Um, it's published in January. Now, what we um, some of the statistics and data, and it's just incredibly rich in data. Um, uh, on a whole range of the ways that we see poverty interact with lots of different social issues from education to disability to work, social security. So what we know is that around 8.1 million working age adults are in poverty, 4.2 million children. And if you add those together and you add in um, pensioners as well, then about 22 percent of the UK population. And that's that's horrendous. You know, that is not good enough. We shouldn't have uh, such high um, poverty levels. We know that around six million people as well are in very deep poverty. So that's perhaps not being able to afford the some of the essentials. So incomes far below the poverty line. So that's our starting position. And I'll move on to thinking about like why we think childcare is so important in address one of the to be one of those levers for addressing poverty. But if we think about um, children experiencing poverty. We know that families whose childcare responsibilities limit their ability to work are particularly high, at high risk of poverty. So we know that 44% of children in lone parent households, um, as well as 32% of children in families where the youngest child was aged under five, um, so have those higher risks of poverty. So for those people in work, part-time poverty rate is about twice that of the full time poverty rate. And really importantly, um, whilst being in work does reduce uh, your risk of experiencing poverty, uh, two thirds of working age adults um, actually live in a household where someone is uh, who are in poverty, sorry, actually live in a household where someone is at work in work. So we know that in work poverty um, is a really uh, big problem. Um, so just to give you an example, this is a chart of the poverty rates of um, different children. And we know that when um, families and households um, have younger children in them, then the poverty rate for those children and poverty rate for those households is higher. Um, but overall, though, these poverty rates are obviously far too high. We have far too many children um, experiencing poverty and disadvantage. Um, and um, we need to think about what the policy, what do we need to put in place across the board? What is our package of policies um, to address poverty? Um, and we obviously, JRF, do a lot of work on lots of different aspects of um, uh, policy. So particularly around the social security system and how we can boost the quality of work and how we can massively improve our uh, housing system as well. But we, we really think it's important to look at the power that childcare has and really good quality early years childcare can have in tackling disadvantage. And last year, um, we worked with the Coram Family and Childcare uh, Institute on a new report looking at the components which make up a childcare system which tackles disadvantage. Now, many of these you, you will recognise, but I think it's a really useful thing to refer to, to have it all in one place, to just say, if you want a childcare system that will really deliver um, for families and households and for settings, and that really addresses um, poverty and disadvantage, here are your um, the components that you need. And we identified um, five building blocks. So those are, and I'll, I'll read through them and just say something a little bit about each one. So affordable, so childcare must be affordable for parents to work and therefore reduce the risk of child and household poverty. Um, quality, so provision must be high quality to improve outcomes. So we know that only high quality childcare helps to narrow the attainment gap between disadvantaged children um, and their peers. Um, access. So disadvantaged children must be able to take up early um, education and childcare. Uh, family focused. So a good system means that childcare can support a really positive home learning environment and integrated. So childcare professionals need to be part of a wider system of support around children and families. So what, what we did with Coram is to think about the system we have in England 
and those building blocks and sort of think, think about how does our system measure up if we look at the evidence. So that's evidence from um, data, from different research studies, from, of course, and um, fundamentally talking to practitioners and talking to families. Um, we also, since this report, done this for Northern Ireland and for Wales as well, who have see different um, childcare systems as childcare policy is, is devolved. So we think this potential, so this real potential for childcare um, is not currently being achieved. So with disadvantaged children, um, children from disadvantaged backgrounds starting school behind their peers and parents struggling to afford childcare. And we also think um, that the government's proposed uh, changes, which Daniel talked about at the start, um, to childcare policy risk actually making these problems worse. Um, so I'll go through some of the key points there, but there were um, obviously lots of detail and um, that you can think about behind each of these. So we know that the most disadvantaged children miss out on early years in childcare because their parents or carers uh, do, meet, do not meet um, the work requirements. Um, so if you think about it, um, we wouldn't expect children um, in reception to only come from households that are working. But the year before, when um, there's the 30 uh, hour uh, funded childcare entitlement, um, only parents that are actually work, you know, fulfilled the working requirement are able to access the, that full entitlement. I know there are some exceptions to that, but that just seems wrong. And um, just many organisations think that, you know, you, you're using um, whether a per parents are working as a sort of gate, as a gateway to whether you receive um, early years education. So we know that childcare in England is not consistently high enough quality to make a real difference to children's outcomes. And, part, and linked to that is the just the fundamental problems that we have in the workforce. We know that so many practitioners are doing a brilliant job under very, very difficult circumstances, but we need to invest in the workforce for higher pay, better progression, training, um, and um, uh, conditions as well. Um, so there's, we're, we're not doing that, and it's really interesting to think about whether the new proposals are going to actually deliver on that. We know there are inequalities to uh, who takes up childcare entitlements. Uh, particularly, we know that ch uh, children who speak English as a, an additional language are nearly three times as likely not to take up their full early education entitlement. Um, so we're not getting that access. There's, there's, as we heard earlier from Daniel, there's, the children are not taking up the entitlement when it's there. Um, and we need to do a lot more about um, what know a lot more about why that is and um, you know, put the policies in place to, to, so people, all children can benefit. So next point is the new funding entitlements and also the changes to universal credit support, which were also announced at the same time, will help many families better afford childcare. But there are some real problems that are remaining in the system. Um, and then many children, as we know, with SEND lose out. So we know that only one in five local authorities in England have enough childcare for disabled children. We, you know, there's a real issue with sufficiency. And I know many of you will know a lot more about what those drivers are for why we find that um, real problems in the system and why some families are just missing out. So to think about that, uh, the, the expansion of childcare, where does this policy um, you know, derive from? Uh, where is it rooted? Because I think that's really important to think about the impact um, that it's going to have. So. Those, that expansion was announced in the March budget last year, and it was announced in a package of uh, policies there to address economic inactivity. So people of working age not being in work, but also to provide some help for families um, with, who are working with the cost of living. So that is where this project, that, that is where it is rooted rather than in say a new education policy announcement. We know that the Office of Budget Responsibility estimate the employment impact of these new policies to be around 60,000 people being 
um, moving into work. We also know, know that it will um, impact, particularly on mothers' ability to work more hours. Um, it, the Institute of Fiscal Studies estimate, and this is really interesting, that Whitehall will eventually determine the price of about 80% of preschool childcare in England. So we are moving to a, a very kind of mixed model to one where most of that price setting is set by um, government rather than the market. Um, and that has big implications, um, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so we've already heard a bit about some of the, the um, problems with this expansion. Uh, and there's, this isn't an exhaustive list, but I think the first thing to say, it's, you know, we do need to welcome investment in childcare. You know, that will, I think the total will eventually be five billion pounds going extra into the system. But we would ask, is this an opportunity missed to actually transform the system? particularly for disadvantaged children and families. Um, we know, secondly, that um, the reforms mean that better off families will benefit more. So the IFS have calculated that a fifth of families earning less than £20,000 a year will benefit from the new rollout, and four fifths of families with household incomes above 45000 So that's obviously with children who are in the um, who you know have those will have that additional childcare. So we can see that it um, that it isn't a targeted policy for um, parents and families on low, low incomes. Um, obviously, we've heard about major concerns about the speed of the rollout, and we know that some settings have said they will opt out of the new offer, you know, meaning parents are hunting around for places. Um, there are. Um, you know, we know that when um, there are increases in entitlements and more funded places, there's a must, there is a real risk of children with SEND uh, losing out, as we have this sort of particularly have a real pressure on, on funded places. Um, the system still remains really confusing to parents. So this new system, you know, we're not unlocking um, the complexity of the system with lots of different funding streams different kinds of ways that you can access support. Um, uh, I know some work has been done on that by the government, but you know, we, it's really quite fundamental to be to a childcare being accessed, that it's it's much more simple and easy for parents to use. Um, and of course, and just it's not shouldn't be the last point, but it this this expand this additional funding and additional within the system, this expansion does not you know, go to the heart of addressing the workforce crisis. So, you know, it, it, it doesn't have those strings attached to, for example, make sure um, that early years practitioners are paid, um, paid more. Um, and so it, it, there's a missed opportunity there. And we also really know that that contributes to uh, quality and sustainability of the sector. So um, standing back, standing back, Lots, quite a few organisations thinking about childcare policy and early years policy are thinking, well, what are the alternatives? Like, what what would we do and you invest that money in a, a different way and also bring more investment and funding into the system to make it fairer, to actually deliver better for all children? So um, some of the things that our work with um, Quorum recommended, recommended are that firstly, we don't think um, we should be gatekeep, you know, that work should be a, um, a gateway to whether your child um, accesses, accesses early education. And so that the addition, you know, current support should be universal, particularly for that, you know, we would, we, we know that the cost of that um, could be considerable, but we think that 15 hours for two year olds and 30 hours for three and four year olds. That again, we shouldn't have um, that all children should be able to access that support. Um, secondly, I think we would go further and actually think about what we call supply side funding, which goes directly to providers. So, in a sense, then providers are not collecting fees and um, chasing around those funded places from parents. So, but this would 
have to be attached to a relentless focus on quality. So by rolling out a lot of the things we know, for example, around developing the workforce, and we'll come on to a few more of those strings as well in a minute. Then, so how would we afford that? Like as a country, we'd still have that challenge. It would, you know, how do we actually um, get money into the system um, in a different way? So we suggested a, um, a simple, you know, much simpler means tested system where parents would pay towards their childcare, depending on their income. Uh, but families in poverty would pay nothing. And so you would need to charge some parents who can afford childcare um, to bring additional you know, funding into the system, um, but that that would be um, more affordable and also fairer. Um, so the idea is that is a way of bringing in funding and then the funding is is paid on to um, settings with additional sort of taxpayers um, funding as well, of course. So if you're going to do this, um, it's really, really important that we think about how the sector uh, deliver on those components, those five components to really address poverty and disadvantage as well. So um, what are the strings that you need to attach to make sure that system would work rather than, um, you know, this isn't just you know patching up the issues that are already in the sector, but how would you make sure that um, the additional funding isn't used, for example, just in generating profit? Um, so there's a number of ways. Um, next week, in the next couple of weeks, we've got a new report coming out from JRF and we can circulate it really for looking at this in detail. So like, how would you, what would you do with the market? How would you um, basically develop what is going to turn into a new public service? Remember, 80% of the price of childcare is going to be set by the government. <laughs> so what, what do you, you know, what do we need to put in place to make a real, um, in, to, to govern the sector in a, in a different way. Um, so do look out for that. But just uh, I want to just then focus on what, what would we need to make sure happens for children um, and from children with SEND and settings that are supporting them. Because in a, you know, if you're funding, um, you're doing the supply side funding, you're providing funding directly um, to settings, you need to make ensure that those children are not um, the, uh, you know that we get much better delivery and that we actually because we've put that money in and we also need to find other sources of funding to make sure that the you know really really good quality childcare and early education reads every child so um some of um just going to the line this is my final slide so some of those um policy asks then so we would need to see every child um you know, well-trained Senko in every setting. And I know, of course, that many of you are and that, you know, many settings do have um, Senkos, but we also need to see additional, a commitment to additional annual um, funding um, provided for training. And that that isn't just a, a one-off um, boost, you know, it needs to be there. So we need to have the sector supported by the government and supported with training. Um, we'd like to see the, the uh, rate of the early years pupil premium to match the rate of primary schools. So, again, that provide more funding for the sector, particularly targeted funding supporting disadvantaged children dis and in disadvantaged areas. I'm just checking that um, I'm still down for um, a call today. Sorry. <laughs> um, and then um, last couple of points. So we would also need to see better training of offset inspectors to um, recognise inclusive practice and um, change the offset criteria as well to put more emphasis on quality SEM practice. We need to make sure that um, that inspection was happening. And then finally, we need to make sure that um, supporting SEND is a mandatory training requirement for all year, early years practitioners and that actually is taking place and that settings are fully compliant with um, the uh, two frameworks that um, set out in terms of good practice for uh, children and fam children with um, special educational needs and with disabilities as well. So there are some ideas. It, that is a you know very top line list. Obviously, under there is a lot more. You know, we need to put more, much more detail in it. You would need. To do, that would be really, really important. And I think the final thing to ask to say is that 
for with if we transform the system of childcare, if we have that blank sheet of paper and think, well, what would really work? We would like to see, you know, supporting with children with send at the heart of that and not as an additional add-on and people not thinking about it, really fundamentally thinking about that system, supporting um setting, supporting families. Um, so I had a final couple of questions, but I know lots of you have got lots to say, and I'm really, really interested in the discussion. Um, so if you were to think about that conversation with prior, um, policymakers, like what are your prior, you know, what are the priorities from the ground? Or like, what are the things that, um, if we do have those ear, era policy makers that can make a difference, what should we um, be saying? Um, and then, this is a really big one, but you know, if you were to redesign the system from scratch, what three things would you do? What, what, where would you start? So I'll finish there. I hope that's helpful and, and interesting. Thank you, Louise. It's certainly interesting. I, I mean, I, I just mentioned now one uh, piece of data you threw out there, which I think Christina might chase you for uh, the source afterwards around those of uh, English as a foreign language or second language and their uh, take up. Um, of the childcare entitlement and I spoke before about the intersection of vulnerabilities and clearly um, that's one important one. Part of the um, the remit of the EYSEN program is um, to try and better access those uh, seldom heard uh, communities and that that falls very neatly into that uh, compartment. So um, certainly a lot, a lot of uh, food for thought. Um, we are going to move on now to uh, the uh, debate uh, bit. I'm going to hand over to Christina in a moment to kind of uh, attend to the technicalities. Um, Louise, I'm just wondering, first of all, I'm, I'm hoping that you can, you can stay for this next bit as well uh, to hear contributions. Um, yes, yes, absolutely. I can stay till 11, so thank you, of course. That would be fantastic. Um, and I don't know, um, Christina, you, you can kick me virtually under the table if, if this is out of place. But I wonder if maybe we can um, check if anybody wants to ask a question. Um, on the back of Lee's presentation, it's kind of in, in the big room first. Any any burning questions from from uh, from the floor? Sorry, Louise, assuming you're okay with that, I, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but um... that's fine. I will try um, my best, but I know there's you. lots of expertise in the room as well. Um, so I think uh, there's a hand up uh, from Amy. Do you want to come in? Hello. Um, yeah, I just had a question, Louise. Um, I'm just wondering where you're at with this proposal. Um, like, have you presented it to stakeholders or have you, mm. yeah, have you sent it out to anybody yet? And what have they come back to you with? So we have published the report back in um, May last year. And so that's gone to, you know, as part of the work that we would do, we will also obviously send that out to um Key, the key government departments and also to um, you know political parties across the political spectrum. Um, so we we've made you know we made sure um, that has reached them. That is worth saying. This is one of our proposals, but there are a number of like think tanks, policy organisations in the space that are also thinking you know about much something that is like similar to this with sort of different versions of it but more transformatory so I think there is quite um an, act, an active conversation and people thinking about childcare policy um but it's you know this is quite um long-term reform I would say so um you know it would need that kind of impetus behind it to really think it, because it's quite fundamental to like how the system is set up from what from what I think when we've looked at it and also some of the work we've done in Northern Ireland and Wales there's sort of like two levels sort of where you can tweak and address the system and it would make a difference and so particularly so for example adjusting the early years um, pupil premium um, and make it and also taking away that work adjusting the work and study requirements you could you know you can do things like that that are still quite would be really big quite big shifts um, but then you've also got the sort of bigger kind of, uh, you know, bigger set of ideas about like a redesigned system. So it's almost like it works on two levels and it's really difficult to do. I mean, really difficult. That's our ch our challenge. But like when you're doing thinking about policy, you do need to I think in this space, you, you often have that twin track approach. So like what's what could be done immediately, but still would be quite a challenge. Um, and also what could be like much more fundamental about redesigning the system. 
Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Louise, and thank you, Amy, for your question. Uh, Louise, I, I think you touched upon it, but maybe there's a question in the cloud. If you don't mind, just uh, quickly going over again what supply side funding is. So I think so. This is it's not a particularly good use term, really. I think, but it's it's about at the moment we have this mixed model where there's um, funding through local authorities. I think for the funded entitlement, and then also um, parents pay fees, so they are getting a bill of invoices or whatever from the setting um, if they're paying uh, paying for any extra hours on on top. Um, so you could imagine a model where actually parents aren't, there's no re financial relationship between the setting and the parent. Um, so it would be quite, you know, you'd have to read, you basically have to have a big I, a platform, an IT platform where you're putting in, you're, you're, con you're contributing um, um, money. I think we haven't, with taxpayers' money, so you're sort of putting everything, you're pooling your money essentially, and then that money goes in a much greater amount in a sustainable amount to the setting so you don't have this kind of fluctuating um uh money flowing in and out and also parents have got like a really simple system that they know they need to pay each month into the um onto the platform now this is not not a really common thing that we have in the uk we don't have many of these things i know in um you know lots of other countries you do have this um, more contributory sort of public services where you pay something. Um, we don't tend to, we don't have, I'm trying to, there aren't many examples of that, I think, just generally um, in policy. Um, so that's what it would mean. Um, but it would mean it would be quite different for settings in terms of like being funded. Now, if you think about schools, we don't, um, if school, if, um, you know, schools do not have that financial relationship with, parents or a maintain sector sorry um so you would have more of that kind of relationship between even private for the private and voluntary and independent sector but that is also why you would need to put um those strings in to make sure that um uh, that you get the public service delivered delivered well really well Thank you uh, again. Um, I know there are a couple more questions in the chat. I think what we'll do is we'll maybe we'll make sure that Louise has sight of them. And um, before you leave, Louise, we'll, uh, maybe give you opportunity to, to address those questions yeah, uh, if, if, if you have um, uh, anything uh, to say about them. I think that but they're quite specific, so it would be good for you to, to have a chance to uh, cast your eye upon them. Um, I will. And I just want to make sure that we do have enough time for the conversation. So um, at this point, uh, I'll hand over to Christine and just talk about the mechanics of the breakout rooms, etc. Thanks so much, Daniel. And yeah, a huge thank you to you, Louise. I think it's so easy at the moment because of this huge sort of announcement around the expansion to have our mindset on what that means. And I think it's really nice to actually step back and have a bit of blue sky thinking. So um, in terms of the next discussion, I had put on the agenda to talk a little bit about what the entitlements expansion mean for you. Um, I actually quite like uh, Louise's questions better. Um, so why don't we stick to those two? Um, we're going to go into breakout rooms of about seven per room, and that is 13, if uh, Sam, Sam can correct me if that's wrong. Um, it does mean that we probably won't be able to have every single uh, every single breakout room feedback in the main session when we come back. So um, please do nominate someone to feedback. But um, yeah, if there's something pressing you wish to share wider, please do. Otherwise, we may not be able to get around to everyone. Um, I think we'll do 15 minutes. That will take us to 10.52. Um, and then we'll have about eight minutes for that feedback part. And hopefully then Louise can get some of your ideas which would be helpful for her own work. So yeah, I'll ask Sam um, to put us all into breakout rooms and she will also circulate the questions. <laughs> 